Hey everyone, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Illinois. That's where I was born. I grew up in Chicagoland. I have family roots in Chicago. I went to college at Illinois Wesleyan. Illinois is an important state. We've got the fifth largest economy in the U.S. There's a major city economy there and a major ag economy. And the work Illinois has done to clean up the water, to move on the energy transition, to get the infrastructure ready for the flooding that we expect, it's solid work. Building resilience in Illinois is important and we've got potential. But Illinois is facing a higher change outlook than neighboring states with substantial heat and flooding increases in the projections. The projections for Illinois are more challenging in the NCA5 than they were in the NCA4 with greater than previously projected impacts for Southern Illinois. The heat up is most dramatic south of Peoria. I'm gonna get you all the details on projected changes throughout the state. But first I gotta give you some background about what's going on in the world of climate. So when I founded American Resiliency in 21 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts because back then it seemed reasonable to think we'd hit 2C at mid-century, but that was then. You know, as you know, having lived at 2023 was a very serious year in climate. It really bucked consensus projections for where we would be at this time. As you can see here on this figure from the Copernicus Institute, which is the EU's climate outfit, we hit 2C actually for a couple of days towards the end of 23. We had been around 2C a couple of days in February. 2023 was the first full year the Earth spent over 1.5C over the pre-industrial baseline, and we still are. So these uh, figures doesn't include the information from March or from April, but according to the Copernicus Institute, the average for March of 24 was 1.68C. The April average was released just last week, and that came in at 1.58C. So we're starting to move down and head in the right direction just a tiny bit. But anyone who tells you that 1.5C is somewhere out in the future, they're just not up to date. And all of that, it ought to force us to change our thinking. So this outlook, it's a 2C outlook. And as far as the timeline goes, we're all going to find that out. Let's check out the challenge level for Illinois at 2C. Just so you know where to find my source material, this forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment. This is a recent update. We got the fifth National Climate Assessment in November of 23. If you want to follow along with me with figures, you go to chapters, all figures, and you can download them. The NCA Atlas has a lot of great information that's available at the county level. Dustin, an AR volunteer, ported all of the great NCA5 data into uh, Dustin's tool set here. You can look at different warming scenarios many different climate measures. This is a great way for you to explore at a glance and get quality county level data, exactly the same information as is in the NCA Atlas, but much more easy to use, much more easy to make changes, much more responsive to all. I'm using the fifth national climate assessment because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document and you deserve access to the information. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. And that made me so mad, I founded American Resiliency. We're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information directly to the public, and we run on your donations. All right, so looking at national overview for changes at 2C, you can see in figure 1.14, Illinois is mostly in the moderate change band that covers most of the country and the edge of the higher change northern band up there towards the Wisconsin border. So we're talking about a range of total warming between four to six degrees F. Let's see how that's expected to fall throughout the year. Here in 2.11, even at a glance, I can see that Illinois is looking pretty toasty in the summer. There's more projected warming in Illinois than in Iowa or Indiana. But this figure is gigantic. Let's take a snip out of here and just look at the hot days and warm nights maps together. All right, once we get that snip up there, you can kind of see that there's bands of warming forming up there with a major hot spot around the greater St. Louis area. So starting in the north, the coolest band, which is basically everywhere north of the 88, is looking at up to another week over 95 in the summer, alongside two additional weeks with lows over 70. So even in your coolest band there at 2C, when you consider the daytime and the nighttime heating, that's a fair amount of hot season extension for an area where many older homes do not have central air. Looking south from about the 88 to Peoria, you're looking at two weeks with highs over 95 and three weeks with lows over 70. Now, I do want to give you a little good news if you're in northern Illinois. North of Peoria, you're not going to see many more days over 100 at all. 
in you would expect no additional days over 105 in a typical year at 2C. Chicagoland, you're included in that. It's really nice. We're not seeing 105 projected regularly for Chicago. And I'm going to detail Chicagoland after I describe the projected heat increase for Southern Illinois. So south of Peoria, you're going to be facing another four weeks of highs over 95 with four weeks of lows over 70. And once you get into that band south of Peoria, of that four-week hot season increase, it's really hot. You're talking about three weeks of highs over 95, but under 100, and one week of highs over 100 degrees at 2C. For St. Louis and for Cairo, I'm afraid we're adding another week of heat for a five-week increase in the hot season. More than a week of that, we'll see highs over 100. And I'm sorry to say, St. Louis and down south by Cairo, you're going to regularly see a handful of days over 105 in the summer. That's a very difficult heat outlook forming up for St. Louis. For folks unfamiliar with the region, the greater St. Louis area is a major population center where many folks are quite poor, where much of the housing stock is not in good condition, where many people will struggle to pay for the cooling their bodies need in this warmer future. This heat increase for Southern Illinois is not a dry heat. We're talking about a very humid climate, and because it's a major corn growing region, you also have to deal with the corn sweats, which is a phenomenon where corn produces additional humidity as it grows. So I'm extremely concerned about my friends south of Peoria. These are potentially quite dangerous heat increases. Resilience against heat will be very important for public health in Southern Illinois. And there is just not the funding we need for public health concerns in Southern Illinois. I know for a fact that in Iroquois County, Illinois, they have needed to shutter their Head Start programs in the past due to lack of funding, and that there have been many years the public health department has run out of money for the year right around now, right around May, right before people are gonna need help the most in a warmer future. Let's get back to that SNP and focus in on Chicagoland for a little bit, because I think you can see even from high up here that there is a heat island in downtown Chicago. Downtown, we're looking at three additional weeks of nights over 70, north past Evanston and west to that outer northwest ring of suburbs, St. Charles, Elgin, and Aurora, we see an additional two weeks of nights over 70. That's actually more substantial than your expected daytime heat up. North side, you're looking at less than an additional week over 95. South side, looking at more like maybe approaching two weeks over 95. But the fact that Chicagoland is gonna hold on to the heat at night, that's gonna mean more people are gonna need air conditioning around the clock for a longer period of time every year. That is a big increased energy demand. Older construction in Chicagoland does not necessarily have air conditioning, so this is an important heads up. If your household is making it through the summer with one window unit now, it's time to think about what you can do to step up your game. You're gonna want more cooling power than you have today. Illinois, this is a big heat impact. It's bigger than your neighbors, than Iowa or Indiana. That dividing line where we're gonna see Illinois really shift towards the south really go on full on Southern style and potentially see dangerous heat increases with our high humidity, that line is south of Peoria. And let's talk about the impact of this heat increase for folks who aren't familiar with Illinois' climate. So with the daytime warming, with additional days over 95, we know we don't like that in Illinois. In Illinois, a 96 degree day is not like a 96 degree day in Arizona. In Arizona, you're gonna be comfortable. If you drink some water, you can stay active, it's not a big deal. In Illinois, you're gonna feel disgusting on a 96 degree day. This is a high humidity climate. So when we see this increased daytime warming, we can sense that's a real challenge. And that's why I wanna stress this issue, the impact of the nighttime warming, which may actually have more serious consequences for the state. Nighttime warming, nights where it doesn't get below 70, sometimes we don't think about them so much, but they have a big ag impact. And so especially south of Peoria, I'm concerned that this is a big enough nighttime warming increase. I would be concerned about decreasing yields in corn and soy. The heat increase south of Peoria, it's also gonna have negative impacts on animal agriculture, increasing cooling costs and water use. Now, Illinois is a major producer of corn, soy, and hogs, especially Southern Illinois. I feel like it's worth giving a heads up that all three of these major ag industries will be stressed by this outlook. But, there are other things we could grow and other models for agriculture that we could use in Illinois. The nation's agricultural scene is gonna change a lot as we look to potentially lose a fair amount of table crop production out of the Southwest. And as we look to sharply declining and changing yields 
in the southeast as they move past some temperature thresholds. As we're thinking about agriculture, let's look at the winter change and grow our understanding about how Illinois' climate is projected to change in the cold season. So here we are back in 2.1. We're zooming in on cold days now, your loss of cold. And you can see there, those colors mean that most of Illinois is losing three weeks of winter, three weeks below 32 at 2C. And south of about St. Louis, you're just losing two weeks. So that's a change in duration. What about a change in intensity? For that, we're going to look at figure 11.3. Figure 11.3 lets us look at projected changes in plant hardiness zones. As you can see, this figure is unhelpfully enormous, so we're going to transition to SNPs in a little bit. We're going to be looking at present-day climate normals. The mid-century projection here is about equivalent to 2C. The late-century projection is equivalent to about 3C. So we're just going to talk about 2C and present-day today. But you should know that 3C projection is available if you want to do some farther out planning. No if that's gonna be as accurate, because that's, we're gonna be looking at a lot of other changes in Earth's weather systems before we hit 3C, but it's nice to know what kind of long-term extremes you might be facing. Let's get to the details now. So this is a pretty big warm up here. Most of the state is looking at a 10 degree lift to their winter lows. And where you see the blue retreating across the state, that's where typical winter lows are shifting above zero. So that's zero F, not zero C. You're still gonna be below freezing, but that warm-up makes a big difference in what plants can overwinter and how many pests you're going to need to deal with on the ag side. So you can see the best preservation of a traditional Illinois winter climate is going to be north of Peoria and west of Naperville. There's a fair amount of winter warming that we see there in Chicagoland. And I want to switch us over to a satellite map to show you why. So this is just looking at that satellite layer on Google Maps. And you can see that Chicago is like a 10 by 15 block of concrete from space, right? I wanna contrast that with the Twin Cities up in Minnesota. You can see there's still a lot of urban development in Minneapolis, St. Paul, but there's a lot more green space breaking up the concrete in this city. The fact that we're on a giant block of concrete is a big part of what's driving winter lows above zero for Chicagoland. And if you think that means a more pleasant winter for Chicago, you haven't been there long. When I see this increase in winter lows, I don't think cozy sweater. I think ice storm. You know it's Chicago. When we get a little warmer in the winter, that means we're going to move into that not so sweet spot where we're going to get ice instead of snow. From a Chicagoan's perspective, for the kind of cold where we have to light the train tracks on fire. It's more exciting and it's better for overall transit flows. The thick concrete development in Chicago contributes to a summer and winter urban heat island effect. It's making the millions of people who live in Chicagoland need more energy for summer cooling. And I kind of wonder, how much could we break the concrete up? You know, it's like a design challenge, right? Chicago's a major city. We're the third biggest city in the country, and LA and New York are looking at problems way, way worse than a three-week increase in peak summer cooling costs. People are going to want to be in Chicago. First off, Chicago's awesome with world-class culture. Second off, Chicago's gonna be barely on fire and totally not underwater. Chicago's already investing millions of dollars in getting ready for what's coming. We need to keep thinking creatively because some of our problems, they're an outcome of our legacy infrastructure, which was mostly focused on keeping warm, and they're an outcome of our legacy housing, which a lot of it is beautiful, but it's getting pretty old. All right, let's look at the water situation before I get any more verbose. We're going to go look at figure 210. All right, in 210, we're looking wet. About 10% more rain is heading to Illinois at 2C. We expect to notice that wet trend first in the north of the state, extending then all the way down to Cairo. We all know flooding is a traditional problem in Illinois. We already have very terrible and exciting floods in the state throughout the state. So I'm sure many people with ties to Illinois, they hear 10% more water. They want to know, how much is coming at once. Let's get an eye on that at 212. All right, here's figure 212. It's gigantic. What I do is I look for conserved patterns across these three figures. And I do want to show you in Illinois, this is fairly conserved pattern. We're getting a big hit over blooming to normal. We're looking at maybe 15% more rain per storm there. Chicago, you're getting spared that level of intensity and especially intensity in the consensus figures, but not by much. I want to direct your attention a little bit north of the city to this line of storms that's blasting in just south of the Iowa-Minnesota border, taking some real serious whacks on Madison and Milwaukee. 
you may notice this line of storms is upstream of you. That line of storms has like 20% more rain per storm. In Chicago, we're seeing more like 5% more rain per storm projected, but you're going to get those downstream impacts from the big line of storms. And you know the Displain and the Fox Rivers already love to flood. Those rivers are going to get super crazy from the deluge-type rains upstream in Wisconsin. Another place where we need to look at serious deluge consequences is down here in St. Louis, because look at what's going on upstream of them in Missouri. And I know I keep talking about St. Louis, Wayne St. Louis is in Missouri, but that's a border town. A lot of communities are on the Illinois side and a lot of people in rural Illinois, that's where they go for their goods. St. Louis, you can see you're not directly under the deluge hotspot. Similar to Chicago though, you've got a big hotspot just north of you that's gonna dump right into your watershed. So you're looking at serious increases in flooding as well as serious heat increases and a big shift in the character of the winter that's a lot of threats coming together for the greater St. Louis area. All right, let me be straight with you. This outlook makes me really mad. It, it actually sucks pretty bad. It's way more challenging than the outlook for Iowa or for Indiana. And this whole picture south of Peoria, the challenge level is upgraded substantially from the NCA4 projections. It's rough. You got the good parts version at 2C in the north of the state. North of 88 is best. North of Peoria, you're looking pretty okay. But even up in that good parts version, you're looking at a lot more flooding and you're looking at a heat increase that you are not going to like. The milder winter, honestly, a lot of people are going to like that. And I think that ice threat I mentioned is more serious in Chicagoland than out towards Freeport and Galena. I would say that that part of the state has actually a pretty nice, stable outlook. And those are very nice communities out in northwestern Illinois, very pretty country. In that area, with the winter lows still getting down to 0F, probably many of your mature trees are going to survive, and that's a valuable plus. Keeping as much of the mature canopy as you can is going to help mitigate the impact of those heat increases. South of Peoria, we're talking about a big heat increase that's going to mess with the current ag industries in a big way. The flooding looks bad. St. Louis is facing some real wax from all directions. It's a very high change rate. Chicagoland. You got a big challenge. You got a big projected increase in energy use. The flooding's already a transit problem. Chicago, though, is tough. You've been spending some seriously big money lately on gentrification. The gentrification in many parts of the city is so extreme that the L barely smells anymore, which frankly, that's weird. I feel like that's out of character for us. But if you can clean up the L, I feel confident you can prepare for whatever is heading your way, Chicago. It's important to remember, though, Different parts of this state are facing different levels of challenge, and we need different approaches to get ready together for what's coming. The needs of the millions of people in Chicagoland in the face of this change are serious, but south of Peoria is where we're likely to see more potentially life-threatening conditions emerge. You all have heard me talk about heat and flooding before in other states, and I'm not just lavishing time on these projected threats in Illinois because the state's especially dear to me. I'm giving you this level of detail because these projections represent a serious degree of challenge and change for the state. But if we know what we're up against, we can prepare. Illinois, upstate and downstate, I'm wishing you all the best. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching. And as always, I am just tremendously moved by the support from the AR community. In the end cap for last week's outlook, I asked for some financial help for a car repair so I could get to the climate migration mapping conference where my colleague and I are presenting in Columbus, Ohio in early June. You all stepped up in a big way with donations large and small. You all met my needs and thank you for taking care of me. I'm going to do my best to keep taking care of you all. Big thanks again to our donors, to our volunteers, to all you active members of the AR community, from the folks spreading the word online to the folks putting in plants on the ground. Let's keep at it. Let's get ready.